the insider's look into challenges and successes of implementing direct instruction literacy for all learners. I'm Lindsay Root with McGraw-Hill Education, and I will be the webinar moderator for today's session. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping items. This webinar is being presented in listen-only mode, which means you'll be able to hear the presenters, but they won't be able to hear you. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot participate. Uh, we, of course, want to hear any questions you have, so just type those questions in the question panel on your toolbar for the webinar. Joining us today is Dr. Tina Ertham. Dr. Ertham is the Direct Instruction Facilitator for Greeley-Evans School District 6 in Greeley, Colorado. She develops and provides ongoing direct instruction professional development, beginning and advanced DI trainings, instructional coaching, and student data analysis to all teachers, instructional coaches, and her administrators in K-12 in a district that serves over 20,000 students. So I go ahead and uh, kick it off to Dr. Tina Ertham. Tina? Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, again, my name is Tina Ertham, and I am the Direct Instruction Facilitator for Greeley-Evans School District 6 in Greeley. For those of you who are with us in October for part one of this webinar, welcome back. If you are participating for the first time, I am happy you could join us. We have a lot of information to get through today, and I'm excited to get started. I do appreciate the opportunity to continue sharing with you our school district's progress in implementing RMSE as the core literacy program in kindergarten and first grade in eight of our elementary schools. Today we're going to take a closer look at the steps we have taken and you can take to ensure student growth using direct instruction and reading mastery. I will take a couple of minutes to remind you of our district and our, impl our initial implementation plan for using RMSE as the core literacy program. The majority of our time together will be spent looking at how we've created a system to ensure growth using Reading Mastery Signature Edition. This includes more logistics around appropriate placement, how do we maximize the use of all allocated instructional time, and teaching every student and lesson to mastery. Finally, I am excited to share with you and teach you how to interpret mid-year data using some of our real data from our December testing. As a friendly reminder, Greeley Evans School District 6 is the 13th largest school district in Colorado. 26% of our students are English as second language learners, and over 64% of our students qualify for free or reduced price meals. Our decision to use Reading Mastery Signature Edition as a core literacy program in kindergarten and first grade came as a result of our district experiencing a drop in benchmark data in first grade every year. This drop was significant at the mid-year testing period, and though incredible measures were taken in an attempt to identify and correct the problem, we have struggled to rebound from this challenge to ensure high levels of reading proficiency moving forward. Until this year, direct instruction and reading mastery were used as a core replacement at the Tier 3 level in our district. It was used with our students that required the most support in learning how to read. These students included students with IEPs and students who were significantly below grade level. When we made the decision to use Reading Mastery as a core literacy program, we knew we would be using RMSE at all three tiers of instruction. This required a shift in our thinking in how we interpret and use the RTI triangle to support student learning. In some RTI models, the tiers within the triangle are curriculum based. This means that when students are not making growth in the core program, the green, we give them a different or additional program, the yellow. If student data continues not to improve at the tier two level, we give them a different or additional program at the red. If the students failed, we changed the program. For this reason, students in our district did not have access to DI and reading mastery unless and until the other programs, quote unquote, did not work. Our thinking was challenged because a system of support was created that only contained one curriculum, Reading Mastery Signature Edition. Our teachers and administrators couldn't help but ask, quote, but what happens when Reading Mastery doesn't work? When we only have one program, Reading Mastery, being used at all three levels, the focus at the different tiers is now based on the actions of the adults. If student data in Reading Mastery is not showing mastery or growth, we do not switch the program, we adjust our teaching, the adult action. 
Coaching conversations, professional development, and data meetings focus on what the teachers can do to provide additional repetition, reteach if needed, accelerate when possible, or enrich if time. These adjustments to adult actions are teachable, measurable, and visible, and still must be done while implementing reading mastery with precision, integrity, and enthusiasm. It has been very exciting to be part of such sophisticated conversations around student achievement and meaningful differentiation, all tied to adult action, those teaching behaviors. This was our implementation plan that we went over in our first webinar. This plan took us from our initial planning sessions over a year ago to the start of this school year. Currently, we are a little over five months into our implementation, and we have a lot to be proud of and to celebrate. We spent some time in the last webinar going over these three root causes. DI will work when students are appropriately placed, all allocated time is being used, and the teacher is teaching every lesson and student to mastery. When RMSE is quote unquote working, most likely these three things are all in place. If we see an acceleration in student learning, we want to identify which root cause is contributing to the acceleration and replicate it when possible. If RMSE quote unquote is not working, we must determine which root cause is having a negative effect on student achievement. We meet as grade level teams to problem solve the steps we need to take to correct the problem. To ensure success with direct instruction and reading mastery, there are particular logistics that you must consider and plan for during your initial and ongoing implementation that are tied to these root causes. I'm going to walk you through some of the logistics tied to each of these root causes. So let's begin. First, reading mastery and direct instruction will work when students are appropriately placed. Direct instruction programs, including reading mastery, require students to be placed where they are instructionally. If you have a first grader who is reading at a kindergarten level, he or she needs to participate in a group taught at that level. If you have a first grader that, uh, that reads at a second grade level, he or she needs to be in a group that is taught at that level. Using homogeneous groups helps to accelerate the learning of all students. The instructional groups are flexible and they're fluid. This is not a tracking system. When you and your team are constantly monitoring student data and are able to offer different instructional groups at, that are taught at the same time, students can move within the groups with greater ease. Our goal is to honor each student's rate of learning. Students who do not need a lot of repetition to achieve mastery are grouped with similar students. Students that require a lot of repetition to achieve mastery are grouped with like students. The groups that require a lot of repetition should be the smallest groups to ensure ample practice and application of newly learned skills and concepts. If ever a student's rate of learning changes, we make every effort to honor it. Here's an example of how RMSE groups might look in kindergarten and first grade mid-year. We are going to use um, this school, Excellence Elementary. It's a non-title school in our district as an example. This document that you're looking at is called a group's update sheet. Each building is required to submit weekly updates of their lesson coverage at Mastery on one spreadsheet. This snapshot gives teachers, coaches, and administrators a quick glance as to where their current groups are in the different programs. Teachers can reference this document when deciding whether to change the placement of a student based on their achievement. The spreadsheet you are looking at captures RMSE group information as of December 19th, around the 82nd day of school. The groups on the top half are those that have been established in kindergarten. The bottom half are the established groups in first grade. The column to the far left, titled Current Lesson, tells where each group ended in the program at the end of the week. The second column, titled Teacher, names the teacher of each instructional group. As you can see, the four kindergarten teachers teach two groups each, allowing for six different instructional groups to be formed in full day kindergarten and two groups in the half day classroom. I will explain how this is managed in a little while when we talk about allocated time. In first grade, nine instructional groups are created. Harrington is a special education teacher that takes the students that require the most repetition and support in learning how to read. 
The third column indicates how many students are in each group. This number only changes when we move students between groups. Harrington's group of first graders only have five students or only has five students in it because they require the most repetition and differentiation to ensure mastery. The only difference you will see between our title schools and our non-title schools is the number of groups. Most of our title schools have an interventionist or two that helps decrease the group sizes. Finally, the last column titled Beginning Program and Lesson tell us where each of these groups started at the beginning of the school year. This information never changes, but serves as a point of reference and oftentimes as a point of celebration in seeing just how far we have come with our students. So go back to the first column and look at the kindergarten groups at the top. In thinking about the appropriate placement of all students, you can see that the groups in kindergarten range anywhere from lesson 80 to lesson 145 in Reading Mastery grade K on December 19th. Um, yes, almost half of the kindergartners at Excellence Elementary will finish Reading Mastery grade K and begin Reading Mastery grade one in January. This is a trend we are seeing in all of our RMSC as core schools. The teachers, the students, the parents, the administrators, we are all thrilled. Now look at the first grade groups. We have instructional groups that range from RMSE grade K lesson 94 to RMSE grade one lesson 137. We will have that top group um, in first grade that will actually begin Reading Mastery Transition, which is the 35 lesson optional program between Reading Mastery grade one and grade two in January. We do currently have a handful of first grade groups in our district that are in the RMSE Transition or RMSE grade two um, programs. Again, it's very exciting. Appropriate placement must be ensured at the beginning of the implementation and throughout. Here are three scenarios that you will encounter when implementing a direct instruction program. Scenario one, properly placing students in newly created group DI groups. Scenario two, properly moving students between DI groups. And scenario number three, properly placing students within established DI groups. Let's take a closer look at each one. Scenario one, properly placing students in newly created DI groups. It is highly recommended that you place test all students in the spring before the summer if you hope to implement RMSE in the fall. This helps you determine curriculum needs and design professional development that is meaningful for the teachers. You and your team will need to come up with a plan for testing the students. Questions to consider include who will test the students? When will we test them? Who will collect and enter the data into a single spreadsheet to allow for quick sorting? Who will create the group lists and start lessons? Where will we keep this information so that it can be accessed by all of us? When will a follow-up meeting be scheduled? Who should attend this meeting? For example, all the teams in our, that were participating in our implementation were expected to meet with me to go over the initial testing data before the end of the school year. This helped me develop the summer training accordingly. You will test the kindergartners at the beginning of the school year prior to the first day if possible. And you'll use the same set of questions to create your plan. Every DI program has a placement test that tells whether the students have the skills and understanding to begin that program's level. Grade K's placement test is on the left. Grade 1's placement test is on the right. We had to keep two things in mind and adjust our placement testing procedures accordingly. First, these placement tests do not identify a student's rate of learning or how quickly he or she will be able to master new concepts that are introduced. They tell you that the student has the skills and understanding to begin that level. We also knew based on previous experience in testing students that were taught RMSE as a core replacement that there is a very big difference between the grade K and the grade one placement test. Grade K placement test uh, is identifying two sounds and completing some phonemic awareness exercises. Grade one placement test is a timed reading passage. Yet if grade one is too difficult, the teacher's guide will recommend that the group start at RMSE grade K less than 11. We knew our end of kindergartners last spring had a skill set, just not one that was strong enough to begin RMSE grade one. 
if we were committed to lesson coverage at mastery, we wanted to find a way to determine whether our students could start further into the grade K program. Using the curriculum-based uh, assessment and fluency teacher handbook, we found copies of different mastery tests that would help us determine whether the groups could begin first grade at RMSE grade K lesson 40, 60, 80, 100, etc. We adjusted the placement test scoring sheet to capture the additional testing we gave to the kindergartners at the end of the school year last year in preparation for first grade. This was a great decision and we were able to begin groups closer to where the students needed to be instructionally. So let's go back to the group update spreadsheet for Excellence Elementary and look at where they placed at the beginning of the school year. Look at first grade, the bottom half first. In first grade, you can see that not a single first grade group began in RMSE grade one. This did not surprise us because we knew that the rigor of both RMSE grade K and grade one was more intense than the literacy program the teachers had been using in kindergarten. In fact, there were only a handful of groups across the eight elementary schools that were able to begin RMSE grade one, lesson one on the first day of first grade. So don't be alarmed if you have a similar experience. The teachers have been doing everything in their power to make up the lost ground and accelerate the learning of the students, hoping to catch them up to grade level criteria according to RMSE. We will take a look at just how much progress they have been able to make in the five months they've been implementing the program a little bit later. Now look at the kindergarten group's beginning program and lesson. You can see that all the groups started around the same lesson. We did this on purpose. We could have used the modified RMSE grade K placement testing that we used with the first graders, but because the program and the teaching style were new for the teachers, we felt it would be more powerful for the teachers to begin at the beginning of the program and teach all the lessons. We knew we could accelerate and cre create spreads in the groups over time. In addition to the Reading Mastery Grade K placement tests, we also took into consideration the students' letter naming fluency to create the instructional groups. Students that knew their letter names coming into kindergarten were placed in the higher groups as letter naming fluency is often an indicator of students that may have some pre-reading skills entering kindergarten and their rate of learning may be higher. This too was the right consideration and decision to make in ensuring proper placement from the beginning. This placement testing ensured a proper uh, starting point for all of our students, but how do we monitor and ensure proper placement of students once the groups have been established? Let's talk about scenario two, properly moving students between DI groups. Looking again at Excellent Elementary's group update sheet, look at the column to the far left, their current lesson numbers. Notice how the groups have spread out since the beginning of the school year in kindergarten, all while being given the same allocated time. In kindergarten, we have started to see the spread between the groups that we knew would happen. This is a good thing. Ideally, we want to have a 20 to 30 lesson spread between each group. This allows for manageable jumps for students when they switch groups. The jump up to a group that is higher isn't too high. The movement down in a group isn't too devastating. Um, please know that this, um, this kindergarten spread was only created by having ongoing conversations regarding the student's mastery tests and their rate of learning. If we were not deliberate in meeting to discuss student data, we could have easily slipped into a bad habit of keeping, ki the, keeping the students in groups based on a test they were given on the first day of their schooling career. In first grade, the groups have spread out quite nicely as well. Groups that started fast cycling, noted with the FC, uh, at the beginning of the school year are further than those that did not. Again, we plan for this to happen. We want between 20 and 30 lessons between, le lesson spreads between the groups if possible. There really is a place for every student in a system designed in this way and closely monitored. This is how we differentiate the instruction for all students, often when we think about that tier two. We put them in the groups where they, we know they will learn at their rate. The fluidity of the groups is a focus at all of our RMSE data meetings. The challenge for the teachers 
is to keep the students they have in their current groups in that group or even higher. We do not want to create a bad habit of just moving students down in groups without first adjusting our adult actions, tier three. We want to make sure that we have done everything in our power to remediate and provide extra support for the student at their current lesson prior to making the decision to move a student down in groups. Though we sometimes conclude that that is what is best for the student, it does not always feel good and we track the student's data very carefully moving forward. Scenario number three, properly placing students within established DI groups. This is the focus when you have students that move to your school mid-year. When this happens, you will, be, you will give the students the mastery tests and, or, and or the checkouts where the current groups are, are in the program. For example, look at the first grade groups. A new to the school first grader may be given the mastery test and check out at RMSE grade K lesson 110, lesson 140, maybe grade one lesson 20. We are hoping that we can just drop that student into an established group and provide extra support to catch him or her up. A common problem that you will encounter and we are currently facing is when new to the school students come in lower than the lowest group. This is tough. We try to see where the student needs to be, often placing them in the lowest group and finding ways to provide additional instruction at his or her level at other parts of the day or at home trying to catch him or her up. We urge teachers to meet with families when this situation occurs so that they can convey a sense of urgency and ha having, their, um, having them participate in, at, from the home front in catching their kiddo up. So those are the things that you will want to consider regarding the appropriate initial and ongoing placement of students in reading mastery and direct instruction. The second root cause that we will take a closer look at is ensuring that all allocated time is being used. We know that our goal is to accelerate the learning of all students. We also know that RMSE grade K and grade one lessons typically take 45 minutes to complete with average students, 30 minutes of which are teacher directed. Our district allocates 130 minutes of instructional time every day in elementary schools to literacy. As RMSE schools, we divide this time in half, creating two 65 minute literacy blocks taught at two different times in the day. Students walk to read, meaning they go to their assigned reading teacher's classroom two different times during the day, even in kindergarten. Here's an example of a full day kindergarten schedule. This first literacy block is taught from 1020 to 1125. The second literacy block is taught from 130 to 235. Here's how our eight elementary schools have fit the two literacy blocks into their school day. Our only requirement was that the two blocks not be taught back to back. Two hours and 10 minutes of instruction is a long time for both the students and the teachers. Plus, it creates a sense of urgency to get through the material because you only have a group for 30 minutes. As you can see, some of our schools have created schedules in which kindergarten and first grade literacy blocks are taught at the same two times during the day. Other schools have decided to keep the instructional times different for the two grade levels. There are pros and cons to both schedules. The biggest pro to having the same instructional time for both grades is that you can cross grade, cross grade group your students. High kindergartners can go into groups taught with mostly first graders. If a low first grader um, moves into the school, there might be a kindergarten group being taught at his or her level. Here's how a literacy block is split between two groups. This teacher teaches a group of students that are at RMSE grade one, lesson 27, and a group of students that is at RMSE grade one, lesson 45. We, um, we know that the teacher directed portion of RMSE K and one lesson is about 30 minutes. Note that the teacher is teaching the entire 60 to 65 minutes the groups just switch halfway through. 
it is important to remember the following. Groups are allocated equal time. They are not allocated equal lesson coverage. Group A will be with a teacher for 30 minutes regardless of how much content they cover. Group B will be with a teacher for 30 minutes. If group B can cruise through two lessons in the 30 minutes, that, they, that is honoring their rate of learning within their allocated time. While the teacher is working with group A, group B is working independently at their desks. I must say that this was, hands down, the biggest concern amongst teachers and administrators when we first proposed this model. They couldn't help but ask, how are the students at the desk going to stay on task without the teacher being right there? We have been pleasantly surprised. Our teachers took the time to teach and reinforce expectations of students working independently. Even more, it is incredible how when you give students time to think, apply, and reinforce their learning at their independent level, they dive right in. They can be and are successful in using their independent work time wisely to practice and apply all that they are learning. The teachers usually write the independent work schedule on the board for the students to follow. When 30 minutes is up, regardless of where the teacher is with group A, the group switch, group B is now taught lesson 45, group A is working on their independent work. The teacher must be well prepared with all of their his or her materials for this system to work, otherwise precious instructional time will be lost. When the groups meet again in the afternoon for the second literacy block, the teacher picks up right where she left off. In this example, group A really struggled with lesson 27 in the morning. In fact, they did not complete the lesson. The teacher decides to reteach the lesson in the afternoon. This again is an example of a tier two um, intervention along the triangle. We need to provide extra support to ensure mastery within the program. Group B is working on their independent work from the morning session during their second block. When the groups switch, group A works independently and group B moves on to the next lesson. On this Tuesday, group A got through one lesson at mastery. Group B got through two lessons. Both groups were given equal time with their teacher. Again, we do not work with group A until they get through two lessons. We give the groups equal time honoring that group's rate of learning. Some groups just have moments of needing more repetition. If this is a big concern, like with that ESS teacher at Excellence Elementary, we try to have that one teacher teach one group for the entirety of both literacy blocks. Teaching students to work independently takes time, especially at the beginning of the school year. Once this is done, we find that independent work time is a critical part of our lesson. The primary focus of the independent work is on finishing the lesson's workbook page neatly, accurately, independently, and efficiently. The students then practice reading the lesson story they were just taught. Once these tasks are completed, it is up to the teacher to design the independent work um, time schedule. All we ask is that the teacher think to themselves, him or herself, how can I get my students reading as much as humanly possible? Here are some of the things our teachers have done. Students can reread previously taught or skipped stories in their readers. Sometimes when they are getting close to lesson 85 of grade one, teachers will retype the stories without the print orthography. RMSE grade K and grade one have decodable stories that are, dif um, that are different than their lesson stories, but are written in the print orthography. We definitely use these. We often try to find trade books that students can read independently. Teachers will create word lists for extra practice typed in the print orthography if needed. The planning pages found every 20 lessons in the presentation books often have additional reading activities that are engaging and provide meaningful practice for the students. We have a lot of leveled readers that are part of other literacy programs we have used in our district. Our teachers are currently trying to determine an RMSE alignment to these readers. We want to level them so that students can read them independently they are not leveled 
where the students are instructionally because that would require more teacher guidance. There are also black line masters that are published by McGraw Hill that we call fun sheets. We call them fun to fool the students. Um, as an adult, don't be fooled. They actually provide extra reinforcement of the skills being taught. I think I have some pictures for you. So this is an example of how one of our schools set up their independent work time. The t every student has a folder. And in the folder, sorry guys. All right, back at it. The folder has a must do and a may do side. So obviously on the must do side are the things that are absolutely critical that the students must complete during the independent work time. On the may do side, you can see um, the little decodable uh, story on the lower left. You can see a fun sheet, and this teacher really set the bar for her team. She goes through and hand picks the fun sheets that have the most reading on them. So this one has a lot of reading going on, so she's like, I absolutely want my student to do, do this one. She also went in um, and typed up new words um, or hard words that the students need to have extra practice on. And so that's how she establishes her independent work time. Each kid has their own folder. Some teachers have created extra um, practice, kind of in the form of an activity center. Um, they'll put teacher-created material in plastic sleeves and then let the kids use dry erase, marker, or dry erase markers to practice the skill or the concept. This is a kindergarten classroom, and the basket over to the left is um, how the students can just practice writing their names. Here's a picture of the decodable stories. I know you can get them in color. Um, we tend to buy just the black line mastered books. These are the, what we call the fun sheets. Again, you can find these. Um, they're, they're called black line masters. We just call them fun sheets. And we try to find the ones that are um, have a lot to do with reading. This is a great one in our district and maybe in yours as well. We struggle with prepositions because we're a low language, so this is an excellent reinforcement. We would probably tend to shy away from this one just because it's cutting and pasting. And what's really interesting is our kids want to read. Uh, they really aren't interested in coloring and cutting and pasting and being distracted. When they're done reading and doing their worksheet, they really just want to read something else. They feel very successful. All right. So those are a few things to consider and plan for with regards to how um, allocated time can be maximized during your RMSE instruction. Uh, finally, and sometimes the most difficult consideration to ensure growth with direct instruction is that the teacher is teaching every lesson and every student to mastery. For this reason, schools and districts that hope to implement RMSE as a core literacy program must develop a system of support for the teachers and administrators, both initially and ongoing. We have developed a very strong professional development plan for the teachers and the administrators throughout the implementation. This support will continue beyond the first year. When asked what the contributing factors have been in the implementation success, most teachers and administrators agree that the support and ongoing training they are provided have made the biggest difference. Our teachers participate in ongoing coaching with our DI coaches. Most teachers are watched at least once every two weeks for anywhere from anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour. The coaches can watch the teacher teach. They may team teach a lesson with the teacher or they may model a lesson. It all depends on what they feel would be best for the teacher in increasing his or her effectiveness. Teachers are always provided written feedback after the observation to capture the things that are going really well and help them remember their next steps. We had 10 weeks of weekly modules at the beginning of the school year to train teachers on the data collection process, data monitoring, and data analysis. We brought these modules back for the month of January to give our teachers kind of a booster shot. Uh, this time was also used to regroup students uh, now that we had a semester under our belt and our mid-year data was in. I showed you this um, slide last time. Our coaches use the goldenrod form to focus their coaching time um, to observe and help teacher, the teachers progress in implementing the DI teaching practices with precision, integrity, and enthusiasm. We know that DI doesn't teach children. Teachers do. Frequent and ongoing feedback to them, the teachers, is critical 
in accelerating their own learning of RMSE and direct instruction. It also helps prevent any bad habits from forming too soon. Here are a few examples of write-ups that would follow a coaching cycle. We note all the fantastic teaching practices that are in place and we want to have the teacher continue. And then we give them, um, the teacher, a couple of considerations, modifications, or next steps. Everything that is written, especially the next steps, is discussed with the teacher at the end of the lesson before the coach leaves the classroom. We have also provided professional development for the administrators. We have four formal site visit trainings in which the RMSE as core principles come together for new learning, data analysis, and determining next steps. I also walk through RMSE classrooms with each principal throughout the semester to help them understand the programs a bit more and collaborate on what they can do to support the teachers and the implementation. Our principals are incredible, always eager to learn new things and always excited to share out all the good things they are seeing in the RMSE classrooms. I have trained the principals on how to use a particular observation form. Uh, though these forms may contain language used by the DI coaches, the DI coaches do not use these forms. We have created four, and we call them round documents, um, for observation feedback. These rounds last anywhere between one to two weeks to demonstrate the mastery to maybe a month or even a semester. This is an example of a round one document we created. It has elements of the golden rod sheet, but gives concrete examples that a principal can look for in a DI lesson that isn't super specific to the program. We leave that level of detail um, to the coaches. So for this round one form, the teachers themselves decided that they should be able to complete all the tasks in one to two weeks because it is heavily focused on setup and prep and classroom management. Round two and three start looking um, at the other teaching practices following what might be a natural progression of skill development by the teacher. We give copies of all the round documents to the teachers and provide rationale for every item before we use it. Like the students, it is important that our teachers know what the targets are that they are trying to hit and that they, are, they get very clear feedback on how well they are progressing toward their targets. The teaching practices tied to DI are visible, measurable, and teachable. These round documents provide another way to give frequent feedback to our teachers. So that was a lot of information. Um, I am hopeful that you were able to make connections between some of the logistics we need to consider in an implementation with the root causes and that will help you ensure growth with DI and reading mastery. So I am excited to actually share some data with you. Uh, we're gonna use uh, Excellence Elementary one more time. We're gonna look at their data and I am going, and know that the data that I'm showing you with Excellence Elementary is representative, representative of the district that we see across all of our schools. All right, so where should average RMSE students be at the beginning, middle, and end of the school year if they are being taught to mastery? There are 160 lessons in RMSE grade K and 160 lessons in RMSE grade one. Knowing this, I want you to think of lesson 80 as being the mid-year goal for average kindergartners. Lesson 160 is the end goal for average kindergartners. In first grade, RMSE grade one, lesson 80 is the mid-year goal for average first graders. Lesson 160 is the goal for the end of the year. So I'm gonna explain this slide to you. There's a lot of information on it. Uh, this is the kindergarten at Excellence Elementary. So before explaining the connection between RMSE and out of program assessments like Dibbles, I want to focus on the role of lesson coverage at mastery and using all the allocated time to accelerate the learning of all students, whether it is to catch them up or to challenge them. Remember in kindergarten, our goal is to complete all of RMSE grade K at mastery by the end of kindergarten. For this to happen, this teachers need to get through um, a lesson a day at mastery. So the beginning of the year, all of our kinders started at lesson grade K, lesson, grade K, lesson one or 11, and we did use LNF. 
So the 66th day of school, at the end of that 66th day of school, you can see where all our groups landed. The, um, the lowest group was at lesson 47. They're about 19 days behind in instruction. Uh, the next group has about eight days that they have kind of in the bank, that's a buffer. If you pop down to the bottom, grade K, lesson 124, they are 58 days ahead of schedule. And so this is that group that I told you is actually starting RMSE grade one probably by the end of January. Here's first grade. Remember that in first grade, our students place tested into grade K, the grade K program. That's on the left. None of them were ready for RMSE grade one on the first day of school. So you can see the progress that they've made. So even that lowest group, um, they started lesson one, they got up to K lesson 76. They're still a solid year behind, but we're slowly creeping up on um, trying to close that gap. When you go down to, let's say, um, the grade K lesson 40 group that started in the, in the fall, now they're at the end of grade K. They have, in 69 days of instruction, been able to cover the equivalent of 116 lessons at mastery. So they've, they're they closing that gap. They're at, you know, they have 47 days that they have made up lost time for. When you look at that bottom group that started at lesson 80 in grade K, halfway through kinder, by that 69th day of first grade, they had covered the equivalent of 190 lessons at mastery. Now this could be done through skipping lessons, through testing up, so they, the kids may not have been taught every single one of those lessons, but their rate of learning was saying, let's go, let's go, and so they have closed that gap. This is the group that is in the RMSE transition program. I think they started earlier this week. All right, so hang on one second. And we align our expectations for student performance on outside testing measures like Dibbles according to where they are in RMSE. For example, if you have a kindergartner and you are on lesson 85 of RMSE grade K at the middle of kindergarten, you should meet the benchmark criteria for mid-year assessment in kindergarten if those students are appropriately placed and you're teaching the mastery. If you are a first grader in RMSE grade K lesson 145, at the middle of first grade, you are, and you, if you're appropriately placed, you should not hit the benchmark for mid-year first grade because you're actually reading at an end of kindergarten level. So when you look at that group's data, their data should actually show growth at the end of a kinder level. If they're seeing growth in the first grade level, you, it makes you wonder if the students or that student is appropriately placed. All right, so let's play a little game. All right, uh, our teachers could not look at their data as a classroom. So if I had a, my home my homeroom classroom, if I pulled up their Dibbles data, it made no sense. But if you create little cohorts of the data according to where they are in RMSE, you can start seeing some predictive um, behaviors amongst the groups. So here's how we presented it to the student or to the teachers when we were looking at the data. Knowing that, let's look at first grade, knowing that mid-year you wanted to get to lesson 80 at mastery, if there is an alignment between lesson 80 and the dibbles, any student that hits lesson 80 by mid-year first grade should be green or benchmark on dibbles. So what we would always do is say, take a look at the first graders, make a prediction. That lesson 110 group, you would predict that they would be green and your prediction would be correct. So that you can see where they start at the beginning of the year and then you can see where they are in the middle of the year. When you open up their middle of the year data, you can see that they are solid across the board um, look at their DORF scores, which is the third column of numbers. The mid-year uh, oral reading fluency score for first grade should be 23. The end of the year is 47. Look at their accuracy. That's a, that is a telltale sign of teaching to mastery. Our kids will be accurate when they read because they know how to fight for their words. So let's look. So that last group is all green. 
Go back to the top. Look at the grade K lesson 85. These are first graders. They're first graders being tested at the middle of first grade, but their instructional level says that they are actually in the grade middle of kindergarten. Make a prediction. Should they be green? Should they be yellow? Should they be red? If you said red, you are correct. So when we break down their scores, you can see that they are not at the middle of first grade level in their instruction. Um, what's interesting is the classroom teacher who teaches this group, she was smiling because she said, but Tina, look at their nonsense word fluency. They're reading right where middle of kindergartners would be reading, which tells us the students are appropriately placed. And then let's take a look at one more example. Take a look at the grade one lesson 44 group. So we want to get them to lesson 80. They're on lesson 44. Make a prediction. Will you have green? Will you have yellow? Will you have red? Or might you have a mixture? And what we found is that there is a mixture. Um, our teachers took some convincing, because it's a new program for them, it took a while to convince them that they um, can move with their kids. And so this, uh, what this ended up doing was um, opening up a conversation amongst the groups in the middle to reshuffle the groups. We don't group kids according to their Dibbles data. We group the students according to their in-program mastery tests. But we will absolutely use that Dibbles data to look for outliers or to confirm decisions that we make in the regrouping of students. Our kindergarten data, you would assume that they would all be at benchmark, um, but we did have the hiccup of letter naming fluency that uh, affected some of our scores. Reading Mastery Signature Edition does not teach letter names, we teach sounds. And so we are okay, we understand that data, our teachers understand that data. Um, we know that it's only a matter of time in Reading Mastery before those letter names are introduced. Um, but when we look at their other measurements on that mid-year assessment, they were through the roof. It was very exciting. And those are the trends that we saw in all of our data at that mid-year. So that's all I had for this webinar. Lindsay, do we have some questions? Hi, Tina. Yeah, this is Lindsay. We have a few questions. Um, okay. The first one is about the, the block schedule that you um, presented. So the yes. question is, what, what benefits do you have to teaching both in the morning and in the afternoon? Okay, so because of the time, the time block, so it's hard for people to carve out. I think what they're asking is, it's hard for them to carve out that amount of time. So, right. how did you decide the morning and the afternoon blocks, and what benefits have you seen to that? Okay, so that's a really good question, um, and I can't break it down as to how we decide that because our district tells our schools how much time is going to be designated to the different subject areas, and so in our district, when they looked at research on, you know, we are a highly impacted district, they said every building needs to give 130 minutes of literacy instruction. And so we are, t we tell the buildings, you got to find it. And so that, if you look at some of their schedules, they may only have a half hour for science or, you know, 20 minutes for another area of the time. So it's honestly looking at that time and prioritizing, okay, we're going to put literacy first. There are some school districts that will use reading mastery as the core, and their kids are um, high performing. Maybe they only need a 60 or 75 minute block of reading. Um, so we tell our buildings, you have to, here's how much time you need to allocate to each of the subjects, and then the buildings sit down and carve out the time. Uh, okay. Some, some people will do both blocks in the morning, but they will have a special or they'll have recess or they'll have math between the two. It's the idea that you don't want to have just a two hour and 10 minute block because at that point you feel like you have all the time in the world. Whereas if you have two one hour blocks, you feel like, oh my gosh, I, have, I only have 30 minutes with this group. I have 30 minutes with the next group. I want to get through this and it just helps pace um, the instruction better for the teachers. Great, okay. We have a few more questions. Um, yes. Who conducts the placement testing? Are the teachers involved? Yep. 
so last spring we did a Monday um, at, we have early release on Monday so one of the Mondays at the end of April I pulled all of the kinder and first grade teachers and I trained them on the placement test procedures so all of them were equipped to give the placement test um, then as building teams they decided how they were going to do that they decided okay we're going to do our own homeroom classes and we are not going to have literacy on Thursday and Friday so we can just crank them out other buildings said you know what our interventionists know the program and the testing procedures so we are going to keep on with our instruction and then we are going to have the interventionists pull the kids out in the hall one at a time and get the testing done that way um, so there's a number of ways you can set up your your system and once you've administered about two of the placement tests, you will be in a rhythm and you'll be able to efficiently get through it. Great. Okay. Um, there's a question here. They really like the comparison of the benchmark measures for DIVLs. So are yes. you doing this with other grade levels? Okay. So that's a really good question. Um, and it's hard. I think that it is hard to do with other types of programs because the scope and sequence may not be as scientifically laid out the way 160 lessons in RMSC is laid out. We absolutely use that alignment when, regardless of how old the kid is that's in the program. So we have fourth graders that are in RMSC grade one. They take their benchmark data on in, at fourth grade, but all of their progress monitoring points is on, uh, is on first grade because if they're appropriately placed and you're teaching to mastery, they're going to show growth on first grade material. And when they start to go off the charts on first grade material, you think, I wonder if they need to be moving up in reading mastery. Um, so we tend in the higher grades, because we do use a different literacy program in the higher grades, we tend to give the students the entire year and we just watch their growth on there. So I can't really speak to other programs and how they would align with um, the Dibbles, but Reading Mastery, it has, it has just given our teachers this deep understanding of how they use their data to inform their instruction because they can see, you know, I'm gonna finish grade one at the end of March. So they put their bullseye at the end of March. They don't, put, they don't give that child till the end of first grade to um, get through first grade material because if they're appropriately placed and being taught to mastery, they should be able to be aligned wherever you are in the programs. Perfect. Okay. So another question, um, two part. How often do you move students um, around with the flexible grouping? And also, how often do you review the data? Perfect questions. Um, so we, kids, Kids are constantly moving, but it's not the same kid that is constantly moving. You have to be very clear on that because at first, you know, the teachers have this moment of like, I'm never going to get to know any kids because they're always moving in and out of my groups. That's not what will happen. You get your group started. Kids, okay, kids are moving, but it's not the same child. We did the best we could getting started this year. And then I think about in October, we sat down with the teachers and said, all right, we have 10 weeks under our belt. Do we need to do some big adju bigger adjustments? And we were able to do some. Our big shift in groups came when our mid-year data was when our mid-year data was in. We didn't move kids, please hear me say this. We did not and we do not move kids based on their Dibbles data. We use their Dibbles data to validate the work that we're doing. We put all of our eggs in, our, in the basket of the mastery test. And so we will, we use the dibbles as a point of discussion, as a springboard to shake the groups up a little bit. Um, but I think that this big shift in January that we did, we'll be able to ride this out probably until about the beginning of April. And then we wanna look at the groups one more time to, um, to say, do we need to shift anyone to finish the year strong and set them up for success going into the next year? Okay. A few more questions. No worries. Are you using are you using the language portion of reading mastery? We in kindergarten, in first grade and second grade in our title schools, we use the old edition language for learning, language for thinking, and language for writing. We do not currently use the RMSE language component 
um, in our literacy instruction. And so when I say we have two 65-minute blocks, that is pure reading instruction. They have another hour in their day that they work on writing. Okay. So again, when you think about allocated time, um, we also don't use the lesson connections right now, and we don't use any of the read aloud. We really stick to that research proven box um, with the present, spiral presentation books and the little readers with the print orthography because we know that that's what's proven to work and we're trying to accelerate the learning of these kiddos because we are we have we they come to us um, needing that okay um, last question yep. so you have some first graders that are in mid-year K that you mentioned Yes. Do you think you're going to have as many of those groups next year because you're laying the foundation in K this year? Like, do you think those kinders and for going to first will be um, on level or above next year? You guys know the answer to that, and I love that question. Our our teach our first grade teachers are on fire. I'm going to go back. I'm going to see if I can take you back in the presentation. Um, if you look just even at kindergarten here, you will see that after 66 days of school, these kindergartners are already higher than where, oops, I'm sorry guys, where the first graders began at the beginning of the school year. So the short answer is yes, our teachers are so excited, they just keep saying, I can't wait till next year. I can't wait till next year because that foundation is going to be so rock solid with those kinders coming into first grade. Our first grade teachers honestly need to come to professional development this summer to get some grade two learning because we are going to have groups that are finished with grade one, no lie, by probably Christmas time next year. You pair that with those teachers just having a year of instruction under their belt. Huh, we're so excited. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that wraps it up for today. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, we'll be sending a follow-up email with a link to the recording. And additionally, the first presentation some of you asked about will include that link. Also, as you exit the webinar today, a survey will open and we'd, be, we'd appreciate your feedback to help us improve and plan future webinars. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, uh, we'll follow up with you individually. And if you have additional questions, please email webinars at mheducation.com. We will have the part three of this webinar series coming up in the first week of May, and we'll be sure to include